Welcome everybody. We so said we're going to start at uh, six o'clock sharp and here we are. Uh, still a few people trickling in and we'll let these last few in and then we'll get cracking. All right, there we go. Let's get stuck into it. Uh, we were aiming for about sort of 30 to 40 and we're almost at 30. So uh, uh, I, I, let's, let's try not to double count myself. So we're at like 28 then. <laughs> All right, so let's get stuck into it. Uh, welcome to uh, this month's uh, Sydney DevOps meetup. Um, Lindsay and I've got my co-organizer, uh, Michael, uh, somewhere in here. And I've also got Mick as well, uh, co-hosting, uh, just to let folks uh, through as we uh, to make our way through this evening. Uh, so before we, uh, before we get started, I would like to do a quick acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the country throughout Australia. In my case, that's the Gurindal people, and uh, recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and culture. We pay our respects to uh, their elders, both past, present, and emerging. So, um, welcome to our first uh, online meetup. Uh, it's the, the first Sydney DevOps meetup that we tried running in this format. I uh, expect that it may be a little bit bumpy. There may be a few mistakes along the way, uh, but I'm glad you're all here with us and uh, we, can, we can make all, this, all the mistakes together. So uh, congrats on being here. Uh, quick thing up front as well with the code of conduct. Uh, just it's worth reiterating this. We are in a bit of a different environment to how we normally run our meetups. Uh, so just a, a very quick refresher on this. Um, we don't tolerate harassment, harassment of meetup participants in any form. Obviously, this is a different format, so the harassment may take uh, different forms and different shapes. Um, so it's really important to remember that all communication here tonight uh, and just in general when interacting with the Sydney DevOps community should be appropriate for professional audiences, including people from different backgrounds. Uh, harassment uh, and uh, sexist, racist and exclusionary jokes are definitely not appropriate at the DevOps meetup. Uh, and if we've got people that are violating those rules, uh, we, we may be asking them to, uh, we'll almost certainly be asking them to leave the, uh, the meetup. Um, it turns out when you do that with Zoom, super easy. But I'm, uh, I'm fortunately optimistic that we're not going to have uh, any, uh, any problems this evening. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to having you all here and uh, being part of this this evening. Uh, but yeah, very much looking forward to, um, to having you all be uh, here to help make this a, a welcoming, friendly event for, uh, for everyone. So uh, tonight's agenda, uh, we've got the intro, which is the thing that I am uh, currently doing now. Uh, we've got uh, our first lightning talk of the evening. We're going to do a quick events and job section. Uh, the job section is going to be really interesting uh, because it's the first time that we've done that in this, in this particular format. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm sure that there are going to be plenty of mistakes that we make along the way. So please bear with us for that. Uh, and then we're also going to do a quick uh, lightning talk, uh, two, uh, two uh, remaining lightning talks. So each of those lightning talks are about five to ten minutes. Uh, the talks that we've got lined up tonight are uh, first from Steve McTaggart, uh, five DevOps things that have changed because of COVID-19. Uh, then I'm doing a quick one on how to thwart your DevOps transformation with counterinsurgency doctrine. Uh, and then we've got Naveen Singh from Cloudflare uh, talking about Cloudflare's journey in enabling DevOps for customers. So uh, before we get stuck into the uh, talks for tonight, a uh, quick show of hands for the folks that have got their camera uh, on. Hopefully folks can turn their camera on for a second. Um, if, you, if this is your first time here, please give a thumbs up on the camera. Normally, if I was in a physical room, this would be really easy to see how many people. So I'm just going to tap through the Zoom really, really quickly. That seems like a whole bunch of people. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Lovely to have you all here tonight. Um, and this is normally an easier question to sort of like weed, weed out people that are, that are not from around here. But like given that we're all doing this over Zoom, um, I think we probably all have very different answers. Like how far have you come relative to what? Uh, normally, it's relative to the actual meetup space that we're in, but now you know, we've, we've already come so far. We've already come at least like two months through the pandemic, so we will give ourselves a pat on the back for that. Um, I, I guess my, uh, my first question is a uh, quick show of hands. Uh, anybody who is, uh, who's, who's joined the meetup who is not from uh, New South Wales, we've got any out-of-staters. Wow, awesome. Okay, there's a whole bunch of folks there. That's really great to see. Um, uh, anybody from outside of Australia? 
Oh, I'm tabbing furiously. I can't see. Feel free to okay. unmute as well if you if you want to shout out and say that you're that you're not from around here. I can see one from Singapore. Oh, we've got somebody from Singapore. Yeah. Hey, Sean. Brilliant. Hey, everyone. <laughs> awesome. Lovely to have you joining us all the way from Singapore. And it's probably a quite reasonable time of day over there as well, as opposed to here, which it is. Um, it is very dark outside at the moment. So enjoy that sunshine while you can get it. Uh, any, anybody further afield than Singapore? No? All right. Well, I think, Sean, you probably win the prize for tonight. Uh, it's a virtual prize. It's made of bits. Uh, maybe you will see it. Maybe you don't. But you, you get a round of applause. How about that? We can do that. Congrats. All right. So we are going to get stuck into the first lightning talk of the evening. Uh, we've got Steve McTaggart from Sevo. Uh, going to be talking about five DevOps things that have changed because of COVID-19. Um, Steve, are you on the call? I am on the call. Spectacular. Oh, you are. You know, we were just talking before. Totally blank in there. Yeah. I am going to relinquish my screen and I'm uh, going to give it all over to you. Awesome. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity. I um, have flown all the way in from uh, from bustling downtown Melbourne um, uh, tonight to, to do this. Uh, my transit has probably been about four and a half meters. That's um, I was I was going to show you my my steps for the day to show you how horrible that's been, um, but then I think I would put myself to to shame. So um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I love to talk about everything and anything in the DevOps space. So. I Steve, you muted. Oh, crap. Thank you, Colin. Where's mute? I think that was at my end. I just fixed that up for you, uh, but maybe I'm I'll wait. Yep, there you go. You're good. I cool. Muted? Okay. I'm just going to not touch anything, and then hopefully things go fine from now. Back to you, Steve. Can you all hear me now? Good. Thank you, Colin. Oh, and that was so good. You, had, you missed all the best bit. Um, that was amazing. So... Yes, yeah, so I've, I've flown all the way in from bustling downtown Melbourne um, this morning. So um, uh, really happy to come and talk at a DevOps meetup anywhere and really love the idea of being able to do that more remotely, engage with a different community, talk to a different bunch of people and hear the fact that probably all of our pain points are very similar. Um, so thanks ha for having me. Um, Lindsay threw out the idea of five DevOps things that have changed because of COVID-19. Um, so I took that challenge on and um, we'll see how we go over the next five to 10 minutes. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I've been doing the DevOps thing for uh, a fairly long time now, back from a day before it was actually called DevOps um, and have enjoyed being part of this community as we sort of grow, create our own identity. Um, and for anyone that's actually seen me talk on this topic, which um, surprisingly I do a bit, um, I'm one very much that believes that DevOps is well beyond the tools and technology and is a real cultural and strong cultural movement that's really important for organizations to look at. So really the secret behind um, the, you know, the five changes that have happened because of COVID is actually nothing. Um, that's not really true, but I wrote this last night um, and came up with a whole bunch of really good ideas. And then I actually stopped and thought what I was actually talking about was all of the problems that organizations that haven't adopted a DevOps mindset were actually running into. Um, those of us that have been doing DevOps for a while recognize that we have remote work, we've had flexibility in our world, that we've been able to think about declarative security so that we don't have to worry about uh, enabling VPNs and remote access, um, that we've actually embraced a whole bunch of flexibility in our current work practices that have allowed us to navigate the current climate so much better than maybe a lot of our peers that have struggled. Um, so as we go through these five points here, um, what we might find is that they don't apply directly to us. They may apply to our friends around us. Um, and as I said, I strongly feel that DevOps is a cultural impact that, uh, that covers everyone. Um, so we need to think about everybody else as well and empathize with them. So the first thing I think we've learned is that communication is at the heart of what we do. Um, we communicate in real time, we collaborate rapidly. Um, and for a lot of teams that have been on that DevOps journey, we're well down that path, right? We've been 
big Slack team Skype Zoom users already. But what we've actually found is that a whole bunch of other people are now running into this technology. So where Slack was a nice little quiet oasis where we would live with our modern development teams, now all of a sudden we're finding it's being polluted with marketing and finance people um, and call center staff and everybody else who actually need to learn to collaborate. We're actually spending some of our time, I know at least in my case, helping teach them how to navigate the ways of digital communication to effective use of remote JIRA walls and collaboration boards. Um, and so we're well out in front of this. And I think what's um, changed from our side in this um, is a bit more of a recognition that maybe some of these things that we've actually been working on aren't just a nerd technology thing, but they're actually a business benefit that actually can be leveraged by all of the teams. So much so that even my kids at the moment are doing Taekwondo over Zoom sessions, um, something that you would think is not really conducive to remote work um, and doing it amazingly well. The only impact we probably really had is the reality of stability. Um, anyone that's been working in the DevOps space or has that in their title um, has probably not worried about looking for a job in the last few years. Jobs have come to them. We did a survey uh, a few months ago, probably in November, and there was something like over 800 jobs with the title DevOps um, in them uh, or, or in their titles around the Melbourne market at an, a mean um, salary of 140,000 a year. Um, and, and so that demand there for people that were great, that knew what they were doing to be able to step up and jump into anything went that you could pick, you could take your pick of roles. I know personally, I haven't really worried about a paycheck for the past 15 to 20 years. Um, I've always been able to stumble through work, um, but that changed rapidly. Um, projects shut down, businesses um, handed the controls of their finances back to their CFOs and they made big slashing cuts across the organization, especially for, for businesses such as us that work in that contingent workforce space. Um, we got, you know, the, the contracts weren't as good as the paper, weren't worth the, the, you know, the paper that they were written on. Um, they would just say, thanks um, and off you go. So one of the things I think we've, we've learned a lot here is that we shouldn't take life for granted, that we should be good at what we do. We should invest in understanding the business's strategy and make sure that we're continuously delivering value. And working together to me is the heart of DevOps. DevOps is about empathy. It's about people from all walks of effective delivery being able to work together. Um, and again, this is not something that I think the technical sides or the delivery sides of the business have struggled with a lot. But I definitely know that our, our classic friends in project management um, and the steering committees um, and all of the senior management have really struggled with this ability to keep a tabs on people, to find ways to collaborate, to find ways to support, to seek that feedback. Um, so I think we, again, have been great champions of how do we work together while still being apart um, and continuing to strive for, you know, delivering that shared empathy that's a real important aspect of um, you know, working in a DevOps culture. And of course, solving the impossible. There are so many organizations whose remote work policy was a blank page. There is, this is not, this does not happen. It cannot happen. It will not happen. Um, you know, some of the big banks, again, I'm out of Melbourne. So some of the big banks in Melbourne may or may not have had VPN seats that were numbered in the hundreds. And they had maybe numbered in the 10,000 staff members. Um, which they needed to send home rapidly and find a way. Now, if you know technology like we do, um, those are not problems that they've just run into. These are things that teams have been talking about for years, but have never become priorities. We can't solve that. That's never going to happen. What happens when the business gains some element of focus? All of a sudden, these impossible problems become possible. And I can talk across a number of our customers. We've seen... Um, problems that would classically be shelved and left behind and never um, brought to the fore solved in a few days. And what does that show? Well, what it shows is that they actually brought people who cared and had the ability to affect change together and gave them some support and direction from the senior level and they delivered it. What does that sound like? It sounds kind of like DevOps, right? bring an accountable bunch of people together instead of a networking team and a Wintel team and a security team all living behind Word documents, actually stick them in a Zoom room together and ask them to, you know, 
take a look at what they actually need to make it happen. And within days, we can see this. Um, call centers are a big area. We've seen a lot of call centers remote fire up um, and that has come from demand, but it's also potentially going to allow us to, to innovate and move forward without needing to go backwards. And that brings me to my fifth area. And to me, the biggest uh, impact in the current timeline is around uncertainty. Um, anyone that has worked in a, a classic project management approach will, will recognise the when will it be done? When are we gonna be finished? What time will we be able to say that this is complete? Well, none of those currently seem to apply to the world case that we have on us. No one can tell you when COVID will finish. No one will tell you when we'll be able to move back. And so all of the organizations that have worked from a, a classic project management approach to try and plan their way to success, oh, we can just live like this for a couple of weeks and then we'll succeed or we'll be okay once these new things happen. That level of uncertainty is really abnormal. Um, and it, I may be preaching to the converted here to a bunch of people who are working in, you know, classic DevOps agile spaces. And, and we're used to working in increments where things change regularly and we adapt and we move forward. But large scale organizations don't classically work that way. As much as they've created uh, fake veneers of agility around maybe quarterly reviews or, you know, maybe if you're lucky, lucky monthly strategic reviews, fundamentally underpinning that is still a waterfall delivery based approach um, that really struggles to get feedback from the environment. So the organizations that are truly agile that have had the ability to do that, that have got clear um, strategy and what they're trying to do have really been able to survive the current climate. So then my five um, key things that have changed um, during COVID. Of course, you get a bonus one. And the bonus one is the question that everyone should be asking themselves is, do we really need pants? And um, I will leave it to your imagination as to what my answer to that question is. But as you can see from here, there's no way to know pants even exist. So apologies if I took too long, more than 10 minutes. Hopefully I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, leave you with those five things. Always happy to have a chat about any of these topics or anything. Hit me up on Twitter um, or chat to me on Zoom afterwards. So thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Quick silent round of applause. All right. Thank you for planting the screen back. I'm going to try taking it back over again. Okay, so we're going to keep it rolling straight into events. Uh, now, you would think that given the current climate that we, we probably don't have too many events happening in the tech space at the moment. Uh, but the good news is just in the same way that you've made it here to this virtual event tonight, there are a bunch of other virtual events that are, uh, that are in the works at the moment. In fact, there is one tomorrow night, the Monitoring Sydney main meetup. Um, in fact, I think we've even got Jordan on the call. Do you want to, uh, Jordan, if you've got a moment to unmute, you uh, you ever talk about this for a couple of seconds? I'll give you a whole like 20 seconds. <laughs> Thanks. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, you can. Go ahead and talk. Um, yes, so we have the monitoring meetup on tomorrow. Um, it is at 11 a.m. because um, we are trying to get this to be a bit, a bit global, I guess. Um, but if you can't make it, it'll be online on Twitch afterwards and we'll probably be uploading it to YouTube as well. Um, we'll be having um, Owen Vanderkoog from Link, Linkbot um, and he'll be talking through how he debugged a production issue using observability tools. Um, this one being namely Honeycomb that he kind of used to debug a problem. And then after that, we're going to be having a panel discussion with some cool people to talk about, kind of answer a few questions around um, yeah, what is observability, why they're in it, and kind of demystifying maybe some myths around that space. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and Jordan, are you good to post something as a comment on this Meetup event on, on Meetup? Does it just a link across? Yep. No worries. Thanks, awesome. Lindsay. All right. Um, next up, the other event that's happening uh, in the next little while is the Call for Code Hackathon. Uh, in fact, I believe that we may have uh, another Steve on the call. 
um, to be able to talk about this. Do we have Steve with us to be able to talk about the Call for Code Hackathon? Hi, everyone. You do. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Yep. Can hear you loud and clear. Take it away. You've got 30 seconds. <laughs> Sweet. Um, yeah, so Call for Code's open at the moment. Uh, it's a global IBM-led initiative in line with the UN, but basically we're looking for projects that help um, take on COVID and uh, climate change. Um, so first prize from Global is 200,000 US, plus we work with you to build out a solution. We're looking for just stuff that can help people because, I mean, it's a, COVID in particular, it's affected everyone in all many, so many different ways. Um, we are running a local version of the hackathon on the 20th of June, so happy to post a link. Um, we've got some prizes, a virtual venue, which um, I'm going to show you tomorrow. Uh, as well, but um, yeah, we would love people to enter and I'll post a link for it. And yeah, that's kind of mean, 30 seconds, I think. <laughs> well, right on time. All right, uh, those are the two events that I know about. Although I noticed that we've got Dom on here as well. And have we got an upcoming design system meetup um, in the works, Dom? Well, thank you for the shout out, uh, Lindsay. Yes, we do have one, but it falls on a public holiday. So we're gonna we're gonna move that uh, uh, just by ever so slightly. But I'll be in. Um, you put me on a spot on the eighth of the next month. There you go. So Which is June. Be, 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 that that's the one. Um, so it'll be the day after, probably uh, due to be announced. Awesome. All right, you can uh, keep a look out for that uh, on this meetup page. Uh, hopefully, Don can pose a comment there. Um, anybody else know of any uh, events might be relevant to this crowd that they uh, want to give a quick shout out for uh, for thirty seconds or so? Cool. I've counted to ten in my head. Nobody has said anything. In which case, we're just going to keep powering through. Um, so, uh, next up is going to be interesting. Um, so, the way that we normally run this uh, is that uh, I get people to do a quick show of hands of, of uh, who, is, uh, who is looking for uh, looking for a new job or looking to fill an existing position. Uh, it's a little bit hard to do that. Um, so, if you are in that, uh, or at least in this forum, um, if you are... Uh, if you've got a job that you uh, that you are trying to fill, or if you are looking for work, could you just quickly private message me um, over in Slack and not in Slack? God, you can tell what I've been doing all day <laughs> in Zoom. A Zoom private message. How about that? Let's give that a go. Um, and uh, I will call on you. Um, and you'll have thirty seconds to either spruik yourself or spruik the position that you are trying to fill at the moment. And if none of this works, that is totally cool. Um, is that a, was that a wave there, Mick? Have you got a position that you're trying to fill? Oh, okay, so we got one person. Lovely. Maybe Mick's looking for a job. I'm not going to assume, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I just started a new job. I've got a, right now we've got a head of crowd services role um, that we want to fill, which is to take on um, on-prem and uh, public cloud and own all of that so it's a fairly fairly cool role um sorry i'm from squiz um we are building out our our product suite um into more of a SaaS based model and um squiz has been around for about 20 years now so please message me and if you're interested in head of cloud services and i've got some work coming up i'm looking for people later in the year but i want to start talking to people now and that is for um to help me on a DevOps journey. So we've um, path to production, so DevSecOps, things like that, and a whole bunch of infrastructure as code. So either one's come and talk to me. Or just DM me your details on Zoom and I'll talk to you offline. Thank you. Real. Uh, and then we've also got uh, James Kingsmill from AWS, who's got a couple of positions that he's hiring for as well. Uh, James, take it away. Oh, and you are, I can see the lips moving, but we cannot hear anything. No. All right, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to work it out. Uh, I'll try and call on somebody else. Uh, have we got anybody else that has got some positions that they are trying to fill or anybody that's looking for work at the moment? Test, test, test. 
Hey, there we go. That's working. James, yeah. back to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Sorry, folks. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. I've been meaning to come to this meetup for a long time, but I'm based in Canberra. So this is, this is awesome that we're doing this um, virtually now. Uh, I'm at AWS, and we've got, uh, we're always hiring positions. Uh, we're looking for solution architects in the public sector team. So if you like doing good work for the public sector, uh, shoot me a DM. Thanks. Lovely. Uh, anybody else got any positions that they're looking to fill? Oh yeah, there's a Steve. Steve again. Take it away, Steve. Yeah. So we're we're um we're not actively actively hiring right now, but I can definitely say that the market from our side has started to turn. Um, I'm just actually checking what's going on. So we're definitely eager to talk to people who are interested in um, getting out there and solving real world problems with customers. Um, we're a consultancy based in Melbourne and Sydney, um, a team of around 40 odd. Um, so we're really looking for some people who are passionate to deliver technology to customers that um, you know, can take advantage. So hit me up, I'm definitely eager to start talking now. And um, by the time you know people get out of their current gigs, we'll be, we'll be ready to, to roll. So um, yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Real. All right, I have one quick uh, position as well that I'm looking to fill. Uh, so we're looking for, I work at Section, we're an edge compute uh, platform company. Uh, so we're, uh, we're looking for a technical account manager down in Melbourne of all places. Uh, and it's to help out one of our uh, uh, big customers down there. Uh, so if you are strong on the Linux and Kubernetes side of things, got a, a good background in web performance, and love being uh, you know, a combination of outward facing customers, but also a bit inward facing to work on the platform, uh, please hit me up either as a, your PM or uh, outside of this. All right, uh, anybody else before we move on to the next talk? Gone. All right. In which case, uh, I'm going to flip through to the next talk, which just happens to be me. So hopefully that makes the transition a little bit easier, but let's see how that goes. Uh, all right. Cool. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to take a bit of a journey onto the dark side for a moment. We're going to talk about how to thwart the DevOps transformation within your organization with counterinsurgency doctrine from the US military. So the situation, imagine for a moment that you find yourself in is that you've got a bunch of young upstarts trying to do the DevOps at, at your workplace. And this sort of threatens like the little empire that you built and what you know and what you love about the workplace that you're currently in. And you really need to sort of stop this DevOps transformation in its tracks. Um, so that's the situation we're finding ourselves in here. Uh, and so the solution to that is uh, field, manu field manual 324 from the US Army, uh, published in December 2006. It's about counterinsurgency. This is the biggest counterinsurgency strategy field manual update uh, in US uh, military history. It's been, uh, the last prior update to that was done in the early 1980s. It's got all sorts of really helpful nuggets about how to stop change and how to stop uh, an insurgent force, i.e. people that are trying to do DevOps in your organization from doing that effectively. And so the way that they frame counter and tell, uh, sorry, counter insurgency is that it's a combination of offensive, defensive and stability operations. Uh, so you're about stabilizing you know, the status quo that you've got in there. And then you're doing a combination of offensive activities uh, to stop the counter insurgents and defensive activities to shore up and, and you know, increase the stability of what you've already got. Um, and, you know, the amount of effort that you do in these three different activities changes over time, you know, based on, you know, there's particular threats that you're dealing with, uh, the overall pliability, the population, things like that. So the objective here when thwarting a DevOps transformation um, is that we want to make sure that the status quo, what we clearly have, is accepted as legitimate by most of the uncommitted middle, which also include, includes passive supporters on both sides. So in the US Army's uh, mental model of this, they say that in any situation, whatever the cause, you know, whatever the, the insurgency cause is, there's always going to be about sort of 10 to 15% who are an active minority who are advocating for the cause. 
uh, then you've got uh, uh, another 10 to 15 percent of active minority against the cause, which in this scenario is you. Uh, and then you've got this neutral or passive majority uh, that what that's those are the people that you're really trying to persuade here to actually do your bidding to squash this insurgency. Uh, this DevOps insurgency. So we're really here to just try and capture this, this, new, this neutral or passive majority. So there are a couple of principles underlying all of this. So the most important thing, and you know, it's going to sound obvious, we see this all the time in, you know, in, in software engineering and delivery, is that you've got to actually understand the environment that you're operating in, right? Actually understand the problem. You know, understand the why. So this means you know understanding culture, the groups within that, the narratives, the narrative threads within that culture, and the values as well. So understanding that DevOps insurgency threat is really important to being able to actually counter it. So if we go into like why DevOps, well, there are some interesting narrative threads that have sort of emerged in the last sort of you know five, five, ten years. Um, so if we look at the most recent Accelerate State of DevOps report, some of the key findings from that is that, uh, you know, we want to, the reason we want to do this is we want to deliver software quickly, reliably and safely. Uh, and that, you know, that's really core at the technology transformation and organizational performance overall. So, I mean, these are things that nobody's going to disagree with, right? We all want to, we, we all want to operate reliably and safely. Uh, but, you know, the real problem here is you want to be able to question the methods for how we actually go about doing that. You know, is DevOps really fit for purpose in this environment that we find ourselves? Um, the, uh, the second thing here is, uh, actually, just one second. Yep, no, all good. I am not going crazy. Maybe I'm going a little bit crazy, but you're all enjoying it. Um, <laughs> the uh, the third finding, key finding from the State of DevOps report is that uh, the way that you actually make DevOps scale inside an organization is you, you want to do structural solutions that build a community. So from a counterinsurgency perspective, it's really important to be able to destroy that community from the outset. So funnily enough, uh, the OSS, who is the precursor organization to the CIA in, during World War II in 1944, they published this really awesome manual called the Simple Sabotage Field Manual. And in this, they talk about a whole bunch of things that you can do to undermine uh, you know, existing war efforts, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, around production and organization and things like that. So a couple of the things that they recommend as well is like if you've got this you know, community of people that are trying to form. You want to be able to do things like, you know, making sure that everything is done through channels. You don't want to permit any shortcuts to be taken. You want to make, you know, when you get around these people that are pushing for this DevOps thing, you want to make long speeches. You want to talk as frequently as possible. Uh, you don't want to, you know, uh, hesitate to make, you know, these patriotic comments about what we actually need as an organization. Uh, and you want to fill the space as much as possible with long anecdotes and like personal experience, as accounts of personal experience. Um, you want to try to bring up irrelevant issues, haggle over precise wording. You want to really advocate for caution as well. You know, we want to be reasonable because we don't really know that this DevOps thing is actually fit for purpose for the organization that we're in. Uh, the other interesting thing as well, another key finding from the State of DevOps report, the why here is the cloud is this huge differentiator between the elite performers and everybody else. Uh, so if you can, stop cloud adoption in your organization before it actually happens. You know, cloud is basically, it's a given, everybody's doing it in one form or another, but it's not evenly deployed across your entire organization, right? So what you really want to do is you want to slow down the adoption of cloud to a point where it's actually no, like doing things with cloud is not actually any more effective than if you were doing things on prem with your traditional infrastructure that you've done up until now. So you really want to strip away all the benefits that you're getting. And so you can do that by adding additional technical controls, layering lots of process, change advisory boards, things like that on top of doing things in the cloud. Uh, you can also do lots of things like, you know, co-opting the language. Like nobody would disagree that they want their systems to be safe and reliable. It's about, you know, and so you can use the same terminology of being safe and reliable, right? You're just questioning the methods of how we get to, how we actually get there. Another really important one as well is that, you know, people people say, oh, continuous delivery and continuous deployment is really important. And you can always counter that with, yes, we're all already doing continuous delivery. And by continuous delivery, you happen to mean that we are delivering continuously. Um, I say this not tongue in cheek. I have been in government as the DevOps insurgent, and I have literally had people say this to me. So I know that it works. Um, so take it from me. 
Um, you also want to take advantage of the uh, insurgents' level, you know, general level of immaturity as well. They probably haven't done this before, uh, done some sort of DevOps transformation. Uh, and so they are going to make a whole bunch of mistakes. And when they do mis make mistakes, that's your opportunity really to capitalize on that and say, look, you know, it would seem like a good idea, but clearly we're unable to execute on that. DevOps really isn't a thing that we can make work here. So I think we should probably give a bit of a pass on it and look at another way of doing it. Maybe let's go back to a bit of ITIL and a bit of ITSM. Uh, the other thing as well is around change approval process. We want to refer as many changes back to these change advisory boards as possible. This is the way that you grate people down until they lose all faith in humanity. Uh, so you want to focus all of your criticisms on people and individual contributors and individual performance, not on the system as a whole. The system is fine. It's all about people's ability to be able to uh, you know, execute effectively within that system. And if they're not able to execute effectively within that system, it's because of individual failing, not because of a problem with the system in itself. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the simple sabotage manual talks about this as well. They say that, you know, you want to raise the proprietary of, of any decisions that you make. Like, you know, we actually, do, do we have the authority or do we have the justification really to be able to do these things in this way? You know, we want to be careful that, you know, this DevOps thing isn't actually conflicting with broader organizational strategy, you know, both from a technical perspective, but just like what we're actually trying to do as a business. I mean, are we really a technology business? No, you know, we're some other type of business. And, you know, this seems like a major pivot away from what's actually important about the core of the business. The other thing as well that you can do here is that you can use your intelligence. You know, there's this thing in, in psychology called motivator reasoning. And basically what it means is that the smarter that you are, the better, that it, better you are able to rationalize behavior and ideas that actually meet your own goals. Lots of really interesting research into like ethics and ethics professors and people who do that and the amount of unethical behavior that they engage in. A lot of it, it turns out it's actually a lot higher than the rest of the population because they have such a great grasp of ethical frameworks and they tend to be pretty intelligent, they're able to rationalize that. So you can use exactly the same thing to your advantage as well here. Uh, another really important counterinsurgency practice uh, is that insurgents, you have to isolate them from their cause and from their support. Uh, so what that means, you know, and the field manual talks about this, this is that it's easy to separate an insurgency from its resources and let it die than to kill each individual insurgents. So obviously we're not going to be murdering people in our workplace, but the, you know, the, the, the principle stands, right? Rather than trying to eliminate each person individually, divorce them from the power and the resources they have to actually get stuff done. Um, and, you know, eventually what you're, by doing that, you, you're trying to mobilize that sort of the, 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 uh, that sort of neutral ground to marginalize and stigmatize these insurgents. And that's going to, you know, destroy their claim to legitimacy. So by separating the uh, insurgents from their resources, we're talking about strip as much money away, so budget and people away from any DevOps efforts. So you know, minimum viable budget, you know, viable, it's just actually minimum budget, to be honest. Uh, and power as well, you know, undermine the relationships with the executives. So, you know, remove as much executive backing as possible so that, you know, it's actually, it's like this sort of, you know, little playtime that's happening in the corner uh, that we'll, we'll tolerate for a period of time until we're not willing to do that anymore. Using the appropriate level of force as well is the last thing that's actually really important from a counterinsurgency perspective. So, you know, one of the things that they talk about in this, in this doctrine is that an operation that kills five insurgents is counterproductive if the collateral damage leads to the recruitment of 50 more insurgents, right? So that doesn't mean, and who wields that force is also important as well. So you can't be the bad guy all the time. You don't have to be the person that is fighting against that. You can mobilize other people around you to fight against the DevOps transformation themselves. Uh, and, you know, you, you're really there to influence and motivate this uncommitted middle. Have them make the arguments for no. Uh, and, and most importantly, sometimes doing nothing is actually the best reaction. So when you've got other people, these DevOps insurgents that are, uh, you know, they're being provocative and really pushing for their agenda, you don't have to react. You don't have to match force every single time. You can actually do it. Uh, intermittently, in fact, uh, you're from a, a psychological operations perspective, that's actually one of the best ways to destabilize people is not giving them a strong feedback every single time. You do it at a variable rate reinforcement schedules. That's a whole uh, Wikipedia article right there that you can check out after this. 
Um, yeah, and often what you see with insurgency is, is that they are, you know, performing an act with the primary purpose of enticing a counterinsurgents, i.e. you, to overreact. Um, so you can absolutely use that to your advantage. Uh, and uh, lastly here, the host nation doing something, you know, it's one of the things in their doctrine, doing something tolerably is normally better than us doing it well. Uh, so Lawrence, T. Lawrence, so Lawrence of Arabia in 1917, uh, said as part of the Ottoman Arab Revolution that you know, you don't try to do too much with your own hands, but if the Arabs do it tol tolerably, uh, then that you do it perfectly. It's their war and you're there to help them, so you know, not to win it for them. Right? You don't have to get your hands dirty all the time. Again, you don't have to match the force. So you're probably thinking, wow, this is a really fucking weird talk for a DevOps meetup. Why this talk? Why am I doing it? Uh, really, really simple. Think of everything that we've talked about here and counterinsurgence doctrine um, as a way to red team organizational change. So knowing how uh, the uh, you know, you know, how you might be thwarted and the tactics and strategies that might be deployed against you when you're driving for this sort of organizational change, you can actually be several steps ahead of that and you can find creative ways to get around it. So in fact, you might actually want to go learn a bit more about insurgency doctrine there. Um, and yes, this could be for new tech, it could be for old tech, you can apply it in all sorts of different you know, uh, uh, different situations. All right, that's it. A little bit wild, a little bit wonderful. If you're interested, uh, have a look at Field Manual 324 on counterinsurgency and the OSS Simple Sabotage Field Manual as well. All right, that's that one. Uh, I am going to relinquish the screen. Oh, if I can find where my mouse is. Oh, yeah. There we go. All righty then. So we are now down to our last talk, which is Naveen Singh from Cloudflare. No, do we have Naveen on the call still? Yeah, I'm on the call. Spectacular. I am going to relinquish it to you and uh, take it away. Cool. Thanks, Linda. Hey, guys. Uh, good evening. So I was asked by uh, Lindsay and one of our friends to say, hey, can you give any uh, lightning talk on a topic on DevOps? And I thought, uh, let me just very briefly talk about the journey that our company took uh, in the DevOps space. Um, so in today's talk, what I'm going to do is just very briefly, without getting into the details of things, talk about our approach as a company uh, to DevOps is, and what is important is as a company, while we do have a DevOps implementation for our own products, but as we build new products and services, uh, what should our approach be or what is the approach we took to enable our end customers um, uh, take the DevOps journey. Uh, so just a second, let me just share my screen with you. Okay. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see that just fine. Cool. Uh, it's going to be a very, uh, short talk um hopefully i will be able to fill up the time yeah so a very brief introduction to our product so our in cloudflare we have services both from a security perspective and both from performance perspective and within each of these um, modules uh, security models we have got you know other services like dns specific services ssl specific services vas specific services and the reason why I'm showing uh, these different services is as we started building our product, as we started expanding our product profile, it, uh, these modules became more complicated. So initially we started with just the DNS part and the CD caching part. Then we said we added the WAF part, then we added the DDoS part. And as we add new services, our product profile itself got complicated. So while internally, within our company we ensure that all our products are being deployed and we follow the devops model uh, it was interesting to see that from an end customer perspective our clients when they started uh, using our different services they found initially it they found it a bit challenging um, to integrate it with their devops um, 
uh, with their internal DevOps mechanism. Uh, so what we did was we broke down our whole products with uh, configurations into two parts. One is through an interface that is typically what many of the products have. They have a UI interface through which their clients can come in and configure things. But from a DevOps perspective, uh, the UI is useless. So what we ensured was A, our products, the moment we bring in new products or new services, it should be API enabled. Uh, so we had an API first strategy. So we ensure that every product has an API to configure its functionality. Now, initially the challenge was that having an API wasn't just enough. You should also be having um, API, public facing API documentation. In fact, an API without documentation is I don't consider that to be an effective API because you have to make guesses on how the API works. So we, we spend a quite a considerable amount of time documenting each and every API. And our idea was that from a customer's perspective, they can use this API, follow the documentation, pick up the API and integrate with their DevOps tool with whatever tools they are using. Now, while it worked well, um, you know, we uh, we provided them with certain scripts saying hey run this script and it will configure let's say your WAF profile uh, run this script and it will configure your uh, uh, let's say caching profile but as our products uh, suite grew and as the customers usage of our product grew uh, the challenge was that how do you create a flow uh, of deployment in the sense that Traditionally, uh, initially, it was just about onboarding a domain onto Cloudflare and enabling its DNS part. But now, as a product profile grew, in one flow, how do you onboard a domain onto Cloudflare? How do you configure DNS? How do you configure WAF on it? How do you configure, let's say, bot management on it? How do you configure caching on it? And everything should happen in a single flow. And to be very frank, we struggled with uh, helping our customers out with this. So we, what we used to do is, you know, create this random script. So we created a bunch of bash, bash script. We created a bunch of Python scripts and eventually the scripts really increased. So we needed a specialized script just to do with WAF, a specialized script just to configure caching. So you can imagine as, as our product became more complicated, the number of scripts also became complicated. Then the question was, hey, now we are becoming a, having a big repository of the scripts. So what we thought was, hey, let, let's put everything into GitHub repository. So we, put, we started putting all the scripts into GitHub repository. And when the customer said that, hey, we need to integrate with our CI CD tools, we said, hey, look at this GitHub repository, pull whatever script you want. So while that, I feel that while that was like a band-aid solution, essentially what our end customers needed was a simple module which they can straight away integrate with their own DevOps tools. And that module will take care of everything, right? Deploying deployment from the scratch versus based on certain parameters, just deploying or configuring certain, uh, let's say, WAF module or caching module. So we were always looking for... Um, certain tools that can help us achieve that end goal. So while we have this bunch of scripts, but we also needed a module uh, which we can integrate with and then which we can hand it over to our end customers that will take care of end-to-end -end deployment and configuration management. Now, as we were looking out for various ways to address this issue, uh, we also found a very interesting trend. Right? The current market trend that we found was that uh, there is this trend towards multi-cloud architecture, right? So we found that our clients were, were trying to go the multi-cloud route. So they had their apps in one cloud provider, they had the apps in another cloud provider, then they also have this um, certain apps which are there on-prem. Which is a hybrid cloud. And they're actually having to have separate tools for each of the cloud. So a separate tool that handles AWS deployment, a separate tool that handles cloud uh, GCP deployments. So we we thought about it and we thought that which is a tool that can very, is first of all most commonly used and then that can be used across different cloud providers. 
And what we found was that uh, Terraform was one of the tools um, that was quite commonly used by our clients. And using Terraform, you can deploy into AWS Cloud, you can deploy into Google Cloud, you can even have an on-premises deployments. And we found that the many customers were using this. So what we did was in order to reach the goal wherein a one single module can help deploy uh, the whole configurations of Cloudflare, uh, we developed modules and then um, published it on the Terraform. So what that helped many customers do is while they are already using Terraform to deploy um, their cloud specific configurations, because we already have modules with Terraform, they can then integrate that very seamlessly with their CI CD environment and then even deploy Cloudflare in front so that we can then act as a gatekeeper and then manage the configuration changes across different cloud. So this was a really um, big achievement for us. Uh, the feedback that we got from our customers was that, you know, with Terraform, their deployment cycle, especially configuration changes on Cloudflare really uh, speed up. Their cloud movement uh, was really improved than what they were using um, before. Now, to end with the final learning that I got was that while having modules that were specific to Terraform was indeed important, but any product will have different state of customers. Some are SMB, some are going to be mid-market, some are going to be uh, enterprise. Some are going to be sophisticated enough to start using Terraform um, as their CICD pipeline. Some are not going to be that, um, uh, you know, uh, comfortable with Terraform. So they are going to need tools like your Bash. Some customers are not even comfortable with using Bash scripting, so they need specific APIs. So from a deployment perspective, while it is important to have modules like Terraform that speeds up um, your deployment, I think you need a combination as any product, as we are building new products and new services, you need to have a combination of APIs, API documentation, scripts, as well as modules like Terraform for different state of customers. Each customers will have different needs. And I think with this total combination of documentation plus bash scripting plus Terraform, you will be able to uh, cater to the needs of different uh, categories of customers. Uh, so hopefully that was useful. This I just thought that I will be uh, I can share my experience um, with how Cloudflare went through this journey and how each of these improvements, like starting from documentation to Bash script to Python script to then finally now getting to Terraform, um, it was a very uh, uh, it was a very exciting journey because in every step we were improving, but then end of it. What I, when I look at, look back, I just feel that everything is important. It's not that now we have got the Terraform model, we are just going to remove all the bad scripts or Python scripts. Because we have got different state of customers, each of them have got different needs. We still have to have all of them available to our customers. Cool, so that's all I had for uh, tonight's presentation. Happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, awesome. Let's let's roll into it. We've probably got time for uh, for a minute or two of questions. Any questions for Naveen on that? And don't forget to unmute yourself before you ask the question. You, you talked about multi-cloud. Um, that's like, is that a is that a reality or is it a pipe dream that um, you know, like, are you you're actually seeing people adopting? It is definitely becoming a reality because one of the trends that we are seeing is a little bit of vendor lock-in uh, fear. So what most of the customers are doing is while they are preferring one of the cloud providers, but they're also ensuring that there is at least some kind of a backup on a different cloud. Especially those who are going through this cloud journey, they're ensuring that while they're going to one particular cloud, but there is a backup either in the on-prem side or some other cloud provider. Um, so I think the, the trend I'm seeing is definitely multi-cloud happening. Uh, it, it is slowly, slowly picking up pace. Yeah, we, we talked at the top of the session about um, 
like, like team topologies and the operating model and stuff. And I think that yeah. organizations struggle to sufficiently manage one cloud, trying to throw two or three into the mix is really challenging. So things like Terraform are attempting to help. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Others have their opinion on whether that's, uh, you know, a positive thing or not. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions for Naveen before we wrap it up? One question. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Hey. Um, how big is the DevOps team in, like for Cloudflare? Uh, we have got a pretty uh, big DevOps team. I think our DevOps teams um, consist of 20 folks. So we got each, we got 20 different teams, uh, each team handling let's say VAF, caching, and each of these team have got their own DevOps um, resource. Mm -hmm. So okay. we have got a CICD pipeline, um, and then we have got a process that is very much clearly defined saying that anyone who is who wants to, let's say, add a module needs to follow this, this process, and then individually each of them just follows that process. Cool. And where, where are you working from now? Like which um, country? Yeah. I'm based off Sydney. Our engineering team oh. is still based out of um, uh, San Fran and London. Uh, Sydney uh -huh. is essentially more from a solutions development uh, region area. Oh, cool. It looks like data on there. Oh, it's, it's my lightning of the room. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Hey, Naveen, uh, thanks for the talk. Just a, a quick question on the way that Cloudflare manages the development of those Terraform uh, providers internally for, for the multi-cloud access. Do you have separate teams who look after provider backends for specific clouds or is it just one team? Uh, right now it is just one team uh, who had, re, uh, who had uh, come up with this Terraform modules. Um, I think we, we are thinking of having different teams for different cloud, but we have not yet made a decision because Essentially, all our decisions are driven by what our customers are telling. If we see that our customers are complaining that, hey, you know, we are struggling um, uh, with having to use the same model across different clouds or, um, you know, they need specific to a particular cloud, then we may have a different team or we may come up with a new team for a specific cloud. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see over the next probably 18 months to two years yeah how Conway's law plays out on multi-cloud. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Cool. Real, all right. I think we might wrap it up there. Uh, my computer sounds like it's about to take off just because of the number of people in this uh, Zoom call. So thank you all very much for joining. Uh, it's lovely to have you all here at the, uh, the inaugural one of these. Uh, we are going to wrap it up here. We do have another online virtual Sydney DevOps meetup scheduled for uh, next month. It'll be on the third Thursday, as always. Got one talk locked in already, a uh, bit of a primer on BGP. Um, but if you are interested in giving a lightning talk after getting a bit of a taste of what it looks like tonight, uh, please hit me up. We would love to have you speak. All right, that's it for this, for this evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining and uh, stay safe and see you next month. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks all. Well done, guys. Thank you, guys.